are voters and, and, and the workers in your union hearing that from from Elon Musk? <laughs> well, I think he's got it backwards. We've been enduring long term uh, going backwards for, for decades due to the same policies that Trump's a champion for. And and, you know, what you're talking about, the the three billionaires that have you know given hundreds of millions of dollars to Trump's campaign. That's what this election is all about. You know, there's two very distinct differences here. You got people, two people in this in this race. Kamala Harris is one of us. She knows what work is. You know, she's worked at McDonald's. She didn't play dress up like Trump did. She's actually done it. You know, she's worked her way through the ranks. She's spent a lifetime serving people. Donald Trump has it everything handed to him. He's a representative of the billionaire class. He doesn't give a damn about working class people. And that's what this is all about. Congresswoman, sometimes it seems to me policy is sort of maddeningly remote from the discourse on the election. And there was a sort of amazing moment with a fellow member of the New York Congressional Caucus today, Brandon Williams, Republican, who's trying in a very contested race. The speaker came to his district and he got asked about the CHIPS Act, bipartisan bill to put a lot of investment, uh, including, I think, investment in that district for a big Micron new set, super center. The speaker says, I think Trump's probably going to try to repeal it. Yes. Brandon Williams then has to get up and be like, no, 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 we like, we're good, Chips Act. Then afterwards, they have to put a statement out trying to walk it back. And I just thought it's so rare to see the actual policy here front and center in the campaign. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, it's it's the Chips Act is not a remote and far away thing for workers in Buffalo or workers right here in Michigan that benefit from the manufacturing plants and, and the jobs and especially the union jobs that result and are created that can that people can actually take and will help them, you know, put food on the table without having to work triple or double overtime in order to to to, to accomplish that. And so you know, some people may hear CHIPS Act or some kind of vague policy, but people in Buffalo, people in upstate New York, people in Michigan, they hear about the plant that they work at. And when you have the Speaker of the House, the Republican Speaker of the House, roll up to Buffalo, New York, <laughs> and say, we are going to shut down the plants that give you all your jobs, you better believe people know what he's talking about. And what I love about it, and what I would like to thank Speaker Johnson for, <laughs> is his honesty and his forthrightness about what they plan to do with a Republican majority in the House of Representatives. And I want everyone in Buffalo to know you heard it straight from the horse's mouth, and we'll see exactly what happens if we allow a Republican majority in the House and a Donald Trump presidency. Let me let me just in case people think that I'm uh, misstating this because they are like moonwalking away from it right now. Let me just play Mike Johnson mm -hmm. uh, answering the question. Uh, uh, Sean, take a listen to this. The former president has said that he doesn't support the Chips and Science Act. You voted against it. If you have a Republican majority in Congress and Trump in the White House, will you guys try to repeal that law? Uh, I expect that we probably will, but we haven't developed that part of the agenda yet. Brandon Williams in the background go. Bro. <laughs> and, and this, Sean, this really strikes me as an important part. It really does seem like the Biden-Harris administration, if you look at all the policy, there really has been a focus on an investment, rebuilding the country's manufacturing base, good unionized jobs. And the Trump agenda, as far as I can tell, is a lot of is like an enormous amount of tariffs and tax cuts for billionaires. And I, again, does that come through? Like, do you feel like when you talk to the people that are members of your union that they're aware of that or does that seem remote? Um, look, we've been with our with our campaign. We've been running for the last few months. We've seen numbers drastically increase. We had so we were a majority of our members already supported Kamala Harris, but it's went up by over twenty percent just in the wow. last month because we're putting that message out there. And you know that's that's what this again. You know Trump can't decide which side he's on. I mean we know which side he's on, but like he can't make up his mind. You know at the Republican convention, he talked about you know railed against the UAW for allowing electric vehicles. But then all of a sudden, Elon Musk gives him $45 yes. million dollars a month, and all of a sudden, he's for electric vehicles. You know, these guys can't decide which side they're on or what they believe. It's what people pay them. That's what's going to force what they believe. So, you know, Kamala Harris and with the Biden administration, they've invested in this nation. Donald Trump left workers behind when he was president. He did nothing to stop uh, manufacturing plants leaving this country with, with the with the Harris and Biden administration, we've seen a bigger investment in this country in manufacturing than I've ever seen in my lifetime. So, you know, they walk the walk. Donald Trump is all talk. Mm -hmm. And I think we've seen that, too, with Elon Musk. I mm -hmm. mean, they Donald Trump and Elon Musk went uh, went live together on a stream 
and joked about how they were going, not even joked, they were very serious about how you need to lay off union workers yep. or any worker the moment you, you even sense the fact that they may want to organize for better wages and conditions in their workplace. Elon Musk is a union buster and Donald Trump is a scab. I know a lot about overtime. I'd hated to give overtime. I used to hate to pay overtime. When I was in the private sector, as they say, oh, I don't want over, you know, I, sh I shouldn't tell you this. I'd go out and get other people and let them work regular time. I used to hate to pay overtime, Troy. Oh, I used to hate to pay overtime. Yeah. I mean, what else do you expect? I mean, it's, uh, you know, not surprised. Uh... He leaves me speechless most of the time. I, 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 it's insane watching that over and over again. I mean, the, the things that he says out loud, people used to whisper in back rooms. This scab-ass bastard trying to take our overtime. Any worker, union or non-union, should be offended by that. Trump says he's going to cut taxes on overtime, but they're I mean, really just going to cut overtime. I, I don't understand why people are falling for this rhetoric. It's not like it's free money. I'm putting in the work. It's overtime. Pay me what I'm due. Pretty easy to see right through. The that's that's yeah, that's I mean, it's more of a Trying to take the things that we've worked so hard for over the past generations. It ain't going to work. We're going to take this. We're going to take it hard. We're going to fight. Donald Trump is a scab. Donald Trump is a billionaire, and that's who he represents. If Donald Trump ever worked in an auto plant, he wouldn't be a UAW member. He'd be a company man trying to squeeze the American worker. Donald Trump stands against everything we stand for as a union, as a society. When you go back to our core issues, wages, retirement, health care, and our time, that's what this election's about. This election's about who will stand up with us, and who will stand in our way? Those are the questions that will win or lose this election and will decide our fate. Those are the questions that will determine the future of our country and the fate of the working class. Do nothing but go up. Uh, and it's because, you know, we've talked about the issues that Kamala Harris stands for and just showing the differences between Kamala Harris and and uh, and Trump. And uh, it's pretty clear who stands with us and who's against us. So your internal polling has showed that since she since she became a candidate, since we started hearing more for her from her on her economic vision. I mean, how much would you say? How much has it gone up in the in the direction of how many more people are supporting her? Um, we've seen numbers as much as 20 percent increase. And it was already again, again, uh, you know, it was it was already in the positive. So and we've actually seen uh uh, you know, uh, in, in polling our members, uh, Trump had an overall um, in the negative, a negative, uh, negative, I believe it was negative seven or negative uh, nine, um, you know, in, in, uh, in, in a viewpoint of our members. It's, it's actually went down to negative 20, 20 now. So it's it's actually, mm -hmm. you know, just by talking about our issues and talking about where we stand on those issues, talking with our members, embrace, engaging our members. You know, and with our get out the vote efforts, yeah. I mean, that we've just seen both go both directions. So you it's know, been great. We keep talking about the presidential race on Tuesday night, obviously biggest one we're going to be focusing on. But the House and yeah. Senate and who's controlling that is also at stake. And I want you to listen to, to what House Speaker Mike Johnson, a Republican, what he told Luke Riddell, uh, a student from Syracuse, when he was asked, will he try to repeal the CHIPS Act if they keep that majority? Obviously, the CHIPS Act, for those who don't know, Bipartisan law encourages companies to make more semiconductor chips here in the U.S. And, and I should note, timely for this this soundbite you're about to hear, happens to be bringing $100 billion worth of investment to the Syracuse area. The former president has said that he doesn't support the Chips and Science Act. You voted against it. If you have a Republican majority in Congress and Trump in the White House, will you guys try to repeal that law? 
Uh, I expect that we probably will, but we haven't developed that part of the agenda yet. Uh, we got to get over the election first, and that's why we're so happy to be in New York's 22nd. What's your reaction to that? It's just more of the same. I mean, look, you know, Trump, you know, during the convention, the Republican convention, you know, he was railing against EV battery work and the you know, electric vehicle industry, the CHIPS Act, all those things. Then all of a sudden, you know, Elon Musk decides he's going to give him $45 million a month. Then all of a sudden, Elon Musk is great and EV vehicles are OK as long as Musk produces them. And, uh, you know, they can't decide which side they're on as far as when it comes to workers. They want they want good sound bites and they want to act like they care about workers. But at the end of the day, we know where they stand. They represent the billionaire class. That's who's funding Donald Trump's campaign. Three billionaires have given hundreds of millions, uh, billions of dollars to Trump's campaign. And it's just more of the same. I mean, under under the Biden-Harris administration, we've seen more investment in manufacturing than any time in my life. And those, they're creating jobs in America. Donald Trump oversaw a mass exodus of manufacturing when he was president. So there's a huge difference in who actually has done the work and proven they can they can bring manufacturing, keep jobs. So you can see it there from the rank and file, but also from the leadership and from the most progressive Democrats in Congress. You know, uh, the, the, you know, left wing stalwarts like AOC, who was a Bernie backer and from the candidate herself. Donald Trump is bad for workers. He's bad for workers as an individual boss. We've seen some of that. He's also bad for workers on the economy. Not only will his economic decisions cause turmoil, which is bad for workers, he and his party do not support pro-worker reforms. Look, the whole narrative with Trump was, oh, he's not a neocon. He's not the country club Republican, even though he literally owns a country club where Republicans go, right? Like, you know, or I, I don't know if you call it a beach club where Republicans go. But he's like, oh, he's pro-worker. That's the whole narrative. But what, what policies did he pass for pro-workers? Did Trump raise the minimum wage? Because here's the thing, Trump could have proposed a minimum wage increase and a lot of the Republicans would have opposed him. But I guarantee you, if Trump would have proposed a $15 an hour minimum wage, he would have gotten Democrats in Congress to vote alongside him because Democrats will vote with Republicans when they propose policies that aren't insane. Republicans won't. So Trump had four years to do something for workers and he didn't. Meanwhile, Joe Biden has been, since LBJ, the most pro-labor president. He hasn't been perfect. Harrison Walls have, or Harrison Biden haven't been perfect, but they've been the most pro-worker administration in most people's lifetimes, right? You know, if you're of my generation, easily, much more pro-labor than Obama and Clinton. And of course, every modern Republican as well, obviously. Um, and yet, Donald Trump was awful for labor. Awful for workers. Union rates fell when he was president. They're rising now. And so remember that. If you're a worker or if you want to vote to help workers, you can't vote Trump. 